want to thank you all for coming out today. You know, when you embark on learning something new, there's kind of a long period in the beginning when you're exploring around without much guidance. You don't actually know what's going on or anything. And after a while, you have a framework that sort of appears. During that process, you're trying to sort out who is who and who are the players in the field, things like that. When I first started seriously exploring learning analytics a couple of years ago, this guy, George Seaman, <laughs> kept turning up everywhere. You know, he was writing things, he was tweeting, he was organizing meetings, teaching classes, instigating things. George Siemens is a writer and a theorist and a speaker and researcher on learning and networks and technology, on analytics and visualization, a proponent of openness and organizational effectiveness in digital environments. He got his PhD at the University of Aberdeen focusing on how individuals sense make and wayfind in complex information settings. He's been a real pioneer in open courses, the things that are uh, suddenly exploding on the scene. He's been doing since, I don't know, at least 2008, maybe before. Uh, they've come to be called MOOCs. I have participated in one of his online courses on learning analytics, and I would just tell you that the, the way he's done these courses is very different from the way they seem to be emerging at the moment. Right now there are a couple of companies that have these kind of closed systems that you participate in. The feeling in, in George's course was very different from that. He's been a keynote speaker at many different conferences on the influence of technology and media and education presenting all over the world all of the time. Uh, we're very glad to finally get him here to Ann Arbor to tell us about multidimensional learning analytics. Please join me in welcoming you. Uh, thanks, Tim. It's a pleasure to be here. I had been invited to present once before, but unfortunately, I had to bail at the last minute. So I was uh, I was flattered to receive a second invitation. Um, I'll, the talk I'm going to do today is going to be uh, driven by really, I mean, if, if you, I'm sure as you do in your classes and whatever, sometimes what you talk about is what resonates most with you personally at a particular time. And so a lot of my interest over the last uh, year and a half has been out of a project I'm involved with at Athabasca University, which I'll talk about just briefly to give you a bit of background. So I've had a chance to look at the SLAM talks that you've uh, done, and I, I can honestly say very impressed with the, uh, the focused approach to learning analytics analytics use uh, that I've seen from those talks. What I'll be looking at, though, is going to be a broad conceptual overview of the nature of learning analytics and how to consider learning analytics at a level that goes beyond uh, what's typically more single dimensional analytics models. So I'll talk about that in a little more detail. And so this comes out, as I mentioned, of some work that I've been doing at Athabasca University. I'll just give you a little bit of background in Athabasca. Uh, if you were to look at it on a map, it's about as far north as a human being needs to go. Um, we are, uh, just before I left, we had our first day of frost. I had an interesting experience two years ago. I was at University of Queensland uh, in, uh, in Australia, and it was plus 35 when I got up in the morning and amazingly humid. And I checked the weather back home with wind chill in. It was minus 65 Celsius back home. So a 100 degrees Celsius difference from where I was to where I could have been. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's a publicly funded system. We have about 38,000 students. We offered the world's first online MBA. We were part of that movement that came around in the 1960s. Uh, that's now termed as open universities. And so this was a series where Open University UK, they're sitting at 200 and some thousand uh, students. Now UNISA, which actually goes, uh, the University of South Africa goes back uh, over 100 years. They've got about 400,000 students and there's certain other systems that are looking at a million or a million plus students. So this is the open university system and that's what Athabasca University is founded on. We're publicly funded. We're one of four research universities uh, in Alberta. And uh, we're the only U.S. accredited system as well, and we do the, the, uh, the bachelor's, master's, doctoral program. The faculty where I'm a, a faculty member of uh, does uh, the master's and the, particularly the doctoral program in education. One of the things that's distinct, and this is important to remember because it drives my interest in analytics, is that it's fully online. When you do everything online with your students, you have a significant number of data sets that you might not have necessarily on a campus. Now, that doesn't mean you capture the scope of the learning experience. You certainly don't. There are a lot of things that happen outside of the learning process that you're not privy to, but at least you have the bulk of the interactions that students have with you, with the system, and with one another in the learning management system. Now, we use Moodle uh, as our LMS. 
We also have a second platform that I've been involved with as a research uh, lead now for three years with Terry Anderson and John Drawn. And uh, it's an initiative we call The Landing. If you're familiar with ELG, the open source uh, social network system, uh, we're using this to add sort of a social layer to the interactions that students have in the course itself. So it's one way to put it, and it drives uh, John uh, nuts. Uh, it's a Facebook for higher education, but it's closed and structured. Not everybody wants to participate in open spaces. And so we want to create, for lack of a better word, a virtual learning commons where students can connect with one another and form study groups or just, uh, you know, if they have an interest in, in certain subject areas that are not necessarily academically driven but socially driven, that's where they interact. So that's a variety of activities uh, that we're involved with. And there's an initiative I'm leading now at the university which has really a three-point focus. And that's first and foremost to look at what kind of data do we have on our students? What are we collecting? You know, everything from your student information system to uh, survey work to the activity that they're engaged in while they're involved in the learning management system to whatever else happens on campus. So we're really looking at getting a better sense of what do we have data-wise on our students. I suspect uh, U of Michigan is probably similar to Athabasca in this regard, and that's that we collect more data than we connect. And so we always have that issue of, of uh, not knowing quite what we need to do with the data that we have. And of course, the intent of that is to use it to improve learning. Now, I'm going to talk about a couple of different aspects of analytics. This will probably uh, be review for those of you that have been here for a while, especially if you're at Tim's session, uh, you know, was it a week or so ago? So there'll be a little bit of review there. But my interest from an analytics end is very specifically on the learning process. So it's not academic analytics necessarily, which I'll address in a little bit, but it's really about improving the learning process. There is a secondary element which is a benefit, I think, to the organization, which is making some organizational changes. So as you're, you have better sense of uh, your alumni, as you have better sense of your dropout rates, if you have better sense of where are you marketing your programs, then which students are you drawing in, and how are those students succeeding based on where you're drawing them from. There's organizational dimensions there, and I think it's important, but that's not necessarily the primary interest around learning analytics that I at least have. <coughs> Now, this is hardly a surprise to anyone. Um, apparently, there's a lot of data, and the consequence of that is really driven by the fact that uh, we're externalizing everything that we're doing. Uh, you know, literally eight years ago, you could do a talk like this, and it was actually often cost prohibitive to record a talk. And it was cost prohibitive to stream that talk for someone to look at it later on, which meant that these kinds of things kind of vaporize. And even in preparation for my talk today, it was a real benefit to be able to look back at the last year's worth of SLAM talks and be able to look at the slides and see some of the topics that had already been covered. But that's the benefit of externalizing things and externalizing communication. Students in particular, um, you know, with social data right now, everything from you know, Twitter to Facebook to other forms of social media are generating a whack of data, but mobile analytics, you know, those devices that our students carry with them, uh, that we carry in our pockets, that's another sort of untapped area of the learning analytics space that holds significant potential. If something as simple as a tweet or an interaction provides location data, contextual information that you might not necessarily have when you're just accessing logs from an LMS database. So these, these kinds of real world sensors, I think, are certainly going to place a bigger role and have a bigger impact. You know, it's just a matter of time before uh, you have Connect, uh, you know, a Microsoft Connect type cameras observing learner interaction in a classroom and trying to cluster social patterns that contribute to academic success. So these data trails, again, this is, as I mentioned, the review part, aren't necessarily new because they reveal a lot about ourselves, um, our interests. So everything you know, from, from the sentiments that we have around a topic, the attitudes that we have. I had an ex a pleasant experience recently. I saw I was in Buenos Aires last week, and I decided it would be good if I left my credit card there. And, um, <laughs> and so I get back, and now I'm minus a credit card. So I'm calling you know, the bank and saying, please send me a credit card. And they say, OK, we'll get it out tomorrow. So uh, I'm sure US Post is not like Canada Post, but uh, apparently we're quite inefficient. So I'm on Twitter whining about the lack of credit card in the mail from Canada Post. And then on Twitter, they replied, and they were extremely gracious. And they called, and they chatted. They still didn't bring me my bloody credit card on time. <laughs> but they were very nice. So, but anyway, nonetheless, these attitudes and sentiments, so you can either mine them on you get this impression from what individuals are doing in social spaces that goes well beyond just kind of cold, hard log data. 
Um, and everything from intentions to what we know, uh, even how we learn the models of learning, and in some cases in the language of uh, Eric Schmidt from Google, you know what we're going to do next, right? So you get into the predictive level. And the reason that this interest in analytics is so significant is uh, if you look at all of the areas of interest in education, uh, most of the traditional sectors are facing a variety of pressures due to enrollment, uh, stabilization, uh, perhaps uh, state fund reductions, uh, you know, increased tuitions, a lot of other things are happening. So the one sector, though, that's doing extremely well from the, the K to 12 right to, through the corporate training, higher ed, is the e-learning space. And this is, if you've read the Sloan C annual reports on this, you're familiar with that. Uh, whereas we're looking at single digit, often low single digit increase for state funded uh, university or public university systems, the online learning space has been growing you know, double digits for quite a while. And so there's significant growth there and significant opportunity. The more we do with online learning and digital learning, the more data sets we have to play around with. Now there's a recent McKinsey report, uh, for, actually from last year, so maybe not necessarily that recent, but it looks at uh, which sectors can be impacted significantly by the use of analytics. And uh, you know, all the other stuff from health companies to real estate, and right that tiny little pinprick you see, that's the education space. Now, uh, if you read the paper, the next stage says there are certain prohibitive factors in higher education that result in uh, reduced uh, innovation. Uh, basically, it was trying to say the, you know, universities are bureaucratic. But uh, in spite of this uh, somewhat negative chart, I think there's significant potential for using analytics in the uh, teaching and learning process, and as a consequence to obviously improve what we do in our classrooms, but also how we interact with our uh, students. So learning analytics, the way we've framed it at least in, in a very simple non <laughs> monosyllable definition. It's a measure and collection analysis reporting of data about learners, the context that they're involved in, and we have a primary intent with this analytics process so that we can understand and we can optimize learning or the environment in which it occurs. All right, so that's the way we've defined analytics for, uh, from our perspective, and that sits at an intersection of a variety of ideas. Uh, analytics in education is partly driven, you know, a huge number of factors are at play. Uh, if you're familiar with business intelligence, right now many learning analytics initiatives actually rely on BI tools because that's the field that's been most developed. So if you're using, let's say, SaaS software, or starting to use IBM or Cognos software, I mean, that, that's where a lot of these ideas have initiated. So there's a bit of a challenge here. On the one hand, we're appropriating uh, business intelligence tools, but on the other hand, uh, we have a rich history in a variety of fields around the use of analytics. You know, educational research, for example, is, uh, is, is very much an analytics-oriented field that has a long history of developing methods and techniques that shouldn't be ignored as we begin to move forward in the analytics discussion. Academic analytics, this was uh, framed by Diana Oblinger and uh, John Campbell, who I know has been here as well. And that's more looking at systemic overview of analytics, so using data to improve the experience of, uh, uh, or improve the organization of the university. So it's not necessarily learner target. Educational data mining, uh, Ryan Baker and a few others have been active uh, for, for a while, actually. If you look at the International Education Data Mining Society, they have their conference proceedings and resources available online. And uh, they similarly look at the impact that we can make through effective analysis of data. So trying to tease out what is it that's unique about learning analytics, I mean, there are areas of inquiry that are shared. It's a data-intensive approach. It is also focusing, to some level at least, on improving learner success. Uh, educational data mining, and these aren't, this isn't my language, this is the way they define themselves, is about reducing components and analyzing relationships. So they're looking at what, in some cases, you could define as, as basic research. So I can certainly see a lot in educational data mining will contribute to learning sciences, cognitive sciences, and psychology as well. Academic analytics are an organizational approach. It's more of a strategy. It's the sort of thing that a provost would be interested in. Learning analytics, the way we interpret it at least, is about systems and holes. We want to understand this mess of activity that's going on, but we don't want to understand from a singular perspective. We really want to understand the way in which things are related and what the impact is if you start tweaking one part of the system and how that ripples across the entire system as a whole. So that's our interest from a learning analytics perspective. 
And when we did our first conference, uh, I should mention we held our first conference in uh, 2011 in uh, Banff, Canada at the end of February. If anybody ever invites you to Banff at the end of February, there's really no need to go. Um, and people told me, said, oh, it's the end of February, George, are you sure? I thought, oh, it'll be fine, it'll be in the winter, it's gonna be okay, you know. We often get these nice little monsoons come through and it's kind of warm, it's great for skiing, people love snowboarding, Banff is beautiful. And then the week before, I uh, sent out an email, because I was all pleased, I was right, right? It was gonna be about zero Celsius, which is 32, which is quite nice for, for Banff and you'll enjoy it. Uh, but people showed up and we promptly delivered them a minus 25 uh, Celsius weather condition. I had a colleague from UK, the only thing she brought that looked like it was winter wearable was open-toed sandals. So <laughs> she brought some big old burly furry Canadian boots real quick. Anyway, we ran our first event there and what we tried to do with that conference is we wanted to bring together two particular subsets and we were very explicit as we put together our program committee and that's we wanted on the one hand individuals who had an artificial intelligence, machine learning or educational data mining orientation. So this is a technical view of the learning process, the ability to reduce the data and play with algorithms to make sense of it. The second group that we brought in were individuals who would look at as the psychology or, uh, of learning or learning sciences. So we very much wanted to look at people who were interested in the social experience of learning and understanding the pedagogical dimensions of uh, using data to improve the teaching and learning process. Now, there's a variety of elements that are at play here in terms of what's the focus and what's the benefit of these different levels of analytics. Um, so at a certain level, you know, from a course level perspective, there's a lot that we can gain, and this isn't intended to be an exhaustive list. I'm just quickly going to run through this. But the first level of uh, analytics, which I would define really as being primarily the learning analytics space, is the course level and the aggregate data that gives us uh, everything from success indicators to predictive modeling. And uh, from there, you move up more toward the educational data mining, or re rephrase that, you move more into the academic analytics space where you're starting to look at institutional data sets, regional uh, and national systems where you're doing you know, state comparisons, or even where you're looking at, um, you know, in SEML's uh, language, uh, world class university systems where you're trying to compare university systems. And in each of these spaces, there's a different individual who's interested. Uh, my particular focus generally is on the top two. Uh, that's the learner and the faculty relationship. And uh, so even if we have large data sets, you know, with Coursera and other initiatives, uh, it's a gold mine of data uh, to consider. So if you look at those data points, you know, you might be dealing with million or tens of millions uh, of data points. The value of that is only the degree to which you can gain novel insight at an individual learner level. And so that's the interest, even where you're dealing with big data systems, from my perspective, learning analytics is concerned with that particular outcome. Two approaches that uh, are fairly, the best way I can describe it, these are the approaches that I've seen developed. Uh, the bottom up one is way more fun, but it's very limited. And the reason it's limited is, so at a bottom up level, and I'm sure this is happening you know, throughout the U of M campus, but you have individuals who are doing neat things in their classroom. You know, maybe they've been using clickers for a few years in chemistry and they've started to kind of build some kind of data profile and they've managed to tweak how they use clickers based on how students interact with the questions they're asking. They've managed to use data to purge certain questions from their database or to add others. And you might have somebody who's looked at uh, recorded lectures, the video downloads, you know, who's downloading them, what time of the day are they downloading them, how much are they watching it, and that might have influenced the way they deliver their lectures, the way they structure things. So this is really the bottom-up stuff that uh, is, is happening across campus, and, and from talking to, to Tim Pryor, it seems that's part of what SLAM was intended to do was to bring out those uh, innovations and make them available for others. This is often individual faculty level, Top-down, system-wide, it sounds, as I understand it, is part of what the provost intended to happen with, with SLAM as well. And the reason this is important, in a lot of areas, pedagogically at least, you can get a long way being the lone instructor who's willing to play with you know, blogs and wikis and podcasts and YouTube and, and whatever's available. You can teach a course quite effectively with that you know, sequence of tools that are freely available. But if you want to start doing analytics, and if you want to start building predictive models, and if you want to start uh, extracting insight that can be applied to individual students based on aggregated data sets, or if you want to start having automated alert systems developed that are going to be able to notify a faculty or an advisor or whoever that something needs to be done, you really need the top-down approach. And so 
analytics on the one hand are great at a course level, but to make most effective use of them, they need to happen at a systems level. And unfortunately, not many systems are doing that well. But what we're seeing in a variety of ways is um, you know, everything from uh, the focus on dashboards, recommender systems, predictive models, alerts, warnings, and interventions. This is the prominent area of analytics activity that I've seen so far. Unfortunately, most of this is coming from a sort of a unidimensional perspective. And uh, that presents, on the one hand, new insight, novel insight, and some of the things that might be happening. But let me just give you a few quick examples. And I don't mean this in any way negatively. Uh, this is, I'm just saying these are some of the analytics activities right now. They're helpful. But I'm going to present an option and encourage that maybe we need to rethink the way we approach it in a more integrated manner. So this here, you won't be able to see this necessarily. But this is just uh, you know, looking at uh, learner performance based on login activity, right? So I mean, it's, it, but it's, it's irrelevant. I mean, the particular nature of the chart is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. The point is, it's a very simple data set. It's a very simple analysis. And it just tells you, log in more, do better in your course. At least that's what we think it says. There's a lot of factors at play that would you know, partly uh, you know, belie that. Another model, and this, is, this really is the poster child of analytics, is the, the Purdue Signals, uh, the Core Signals Initiative. I think it's a, it, it really is a wonderful demonstration of what you can do with analytics. But then again, you're really looking at a simplified data set where around, and using that data set and extrapolating it to provide some indication of you know, what's happening with students. Uh, and basically, if you're not familiar with Purdue Signals, it basically assigns, based on a series of criteria, whether or not you are doing well or perhaps you're at risk. And so if you're sort of put in this at-risk category, you might get, let's say, a little green dot uh, that says you're doing fine, a yellow dot if you're not doing fine when you log in to the system, and, and red if, if you really need to get your act together. So it's not a very or an overwhelmingly complex system, but it is a, uh, a very effective implementation of learning analytics based on a you know, limited data criteria. Now, one initiative that's a little bit more involved is the, uh, the open learning initiative. And uh, open learning uh, initiative, you know, heavy reliance on, on cognitive tutors as well. Uh, the system here, again, if you've, and I encourage you, certainly if you have a chance, uh, you know, dive in and uh, play with the system or play with the courses. But once again, the, the extent of the data that we're acquiring in this process is really reduced to what I would look at as, as a simplified data set. They're doing amazingly complex things with it, but it's not capturing sort of the breadth and the depth of the learning experience. And it's very difficult to do that, but the point I'm making on this is that if these are the current state of learning analytics initiatives, they're innovative, what are we going to see coming next that's going to make a broader impact on the overall learning experience? So I'm in no way trying to say that you know, OLI is not a good initiative or Signals isn't a good initiative. I'm, I'm saying this is where we currently are. What could we do to make the learning analytics experience more valuable? <laughs> Another example is Degree Compass. Uh, Austin P has this initiative. And, and this is, again, the, an example of uh, which courses should you take next is, is one way to look at this. So it's a recommender system for your courses. So it looks at your profile and it says, OK, based on who you are, what you've done, uh, we recommend that you take you know, principles of life before you take uh, geology. And uh, so the, this is how the, the system basically works for recommending courses. And it's proven to actually have quite a, a significant impact on student success. But uh, by the same account, you're dealing with limited data sets of trying to look at the profile matching between you know, what the system knows about you and the course sequences that others have taken and how that relates to their success. There's a wealth of other resources that are similar to this, you know, Blackboard Analytics, Desire to Learn. Rio Salado, for example, uh, they know by uh, day eight, with about a 70% accuracy rate, whether or not a student will pass or fail the course, just simply based on the data that they collect in those first eight days. Uh, there's other initiatives, you know, the, the WCET initiative for predictive analytics reporting, which is looking at an N of, you know, I'm guessing the tens of millions they should be up to by now to try and get some learner patterns that come out of that as well. Um, I should have, uh, just out of respect for Chuck, I should have thrown up a Sakai logo, but uh, 
Anyway, so uh, various analytic systems or various LMS systems are using uh, different kinds of analytics and analytics models as well that they're beginning to introduce. Some of them are plug-in systems like this. Uh, this is SNAP, Social Networks Adapting Pedagogical Practice, which runs on uh, Blackboard, D2L, and Moodle. So if you have an existing discussion forum, it's just a browser plug-in you run. It'll give you your social network connections. But again, this is where the question comes in from my end, just like in this case, this is SNAP. And it'll give you your in degree, it'll give you your out degree, it'll give you your clustered connections. And in theory then, once we have that, we ask questions about, hmm, you know, these students that were on the periphery, uh, why did they not pass this course? Uh, and so important to remember, a good visualization or a good analytics uh, assessment is really helpful to the degree that it allows you to ask better questions. So when you look at uh, social network analysis such as this, you go, hmm, what does that mean that this one student is disconnected or this cluster of students isn't connected to others? Uh, how is that reflected in their grades? Uh, or is it? You know, what's their sentiment? Did they choose to be disconnected? And maybe it says absolutely nothing, right? It's just a disconnection. You know, a chair is a chair, said Clint Eastwood. And so these are some of the things that you, you may want to sort of consider with your analytics approach because really what these models do is they give you an option to ask more focused questions. So this is just a simple example. And this, this is one of the things, I, I don't know why I do this, but uh, so this is LinkedIn, right? So this is my network connections on LinkedIn. This is a brilliant example of an absolutely stunningly useless visualization. <laughs> because I looked at that and I thought, this does nothing for me. What's it supposed to do? You know, so you play around, you poke around a little bit. But again, these are illustrations. Some, I think, are very leading edge, you know, signals and uh, OLI for analytics at a unidimensional level. Others, like LinkedIn data, really don't provide individuals with you know, a whole lot that's new from my experience. So the question always is, so what? You know, what am I going to do with this now that I have this data? And so with that as a quick overview of the, sort of the unidimensional analytics, I want to look now at uh, multidimensional analytics and what does that actually mean? Uh, what does it mean to go beyond sort of single variable points of focus with your analytics models? And uh, uh, Caddy Borner has written uh, a great article uh, on macroscopes. It's an a in ACM. And uh, she looks at and makes an important point about the vision of the whole. You know, that we need to start using tools not just to sort of uh, look at the small level uh, points, but to get a broader understanding. Now, in her article, she's looking at science in general. So she's looking at huge scientific data sets. So I have appropriated her term to refer specifically to learning analytics to get a more holistic perspective of what's happening with learners. And in particular, we're looking at sense making around what are some of the, how do we understand the social activities that students are involved in? And how do we understand their conceptual development as they engage in these social systems? How do we, in particular, look at multiple data sets and sources? This is particularly true with your student data. I'm assuming you have chunks of data that sit in a student information system. Your library system has additional chunks of student data. Your LMS has yet another layer. You may have uh, a student uh, you know, help or, or whatever service for help seeking behavior, or you may have a uh, student, uh, some, some relationship or tutoring system. Uh, all of these are data sources and points that you have on students. They may be helpful. But my perspective always is, when you connect, you amplify. So if you have two data points and you connect them and use them to provide an overview, you have an amplification of potential insight for what you might do with those learners. Uh, and then now when you add so social media behavior in particular, uh, that adds yet additional level of uh, complexity to your analytics models. So learning obviously is a, a uh, complex social activity. and creating integrated social and technical systems will hopefully provide greater insight and a more nuanced perspective on what's actually going on. And this is something that Southers and Rosen uh, addressed, which is that learning and knowledge creation are distributed across multiple media. The trace activity of this kind of data is fragmented. So if you're as a, as a uh, someone who's mining and trying to make sense of it, you're looking at multiple logs that aren't matched to one another. And so you have to find a way to try and time-wise or otherwise be able to match these logs and what does that actually say. Or more importantly is that there's coherence of this distributed interaction. It's analytically cloaked, which means you need to find a way to begin to compare your different data sets, your different log files to make sense of what's actually going on and to gain insight 
into what exactly uh, learners did. And this is something, so this is a slide I stole that, uh, from SAMHSA, but it was licensed Creative Commons, so I'm allowed to. But um, uh, so it was just basically looking at, this is just a small example of what happens in the, in the learning process. Uh, where, where are things happening? So you have students on the one hand you know, involved in lectures that maybe you're using a student response system or other activities, uh, note taking, there's discussion going on, but there's a variety of other sources and other activities that learners are engaged in, whether it's uh, you know, lab discussions, you could add social or informal interactions on this as well. So the learning experience of a student isn't this holistic entity that sits in the logs of your learning management system. The learning experience of your students and thereby the ability to meaningfully intervene and provide support or extend the experience of students is fragmented and a learning analytics model needs to weave those fragmented components together to present something that looks marginally holistic. In particular, we're looking at analytics that go around social interactions. You know, how are students connected to one another physically in classroom setting. I've seen illustrations through the use of RFID tags. And Sandy Pentland at MIT um, has uh, similarly used uh, just conversational uh, analytics. So one illustration is you have four people at a table and you have basically a little you know, lighted ball, if you will, that ideally you want it to be at the center of the table. But whoever talks more is where the ball goes to. So if you have one person, don and I know people, I would love them. Actually, people know me. <laughs> Never mind. Who am I kidding? Um, but anyways, it just gives people an indication of who's dominating the conversation while this is going on. These are small, you know, basic kinds of analytics, but they, they give you some indication of social conversation. Analytics around learning content, the different spaces, anytime there's an interaction with the university system, certainly intervention, and of course, that meta-level element where you're looking at how effective are the analytics models that we've created. This is difficult to do, though, right? It's difficult to get immersive and coherent data brought together. Either you have to generate a creative model from these varying data sources, or this is one illustration that uh, Abelardo Pardo uh, did with uh, the use of programming students. So one of the things he was looking at was that he didn't have sufficient interaction data on his students for their programming tasks. So he wanted to gain better insight into what are students doing when they're learning a programming language. And so he actually has them log into a virtual machine, so he's configured exactly what he allows them to use. They can't delete anything without uh, you know, the instructor say so. And it gives them virtually complete data points on what students do as they program. You know, where do they pause? What kind of programming behavior do students exhibit? How often do they have to go back and delete? You know, how often do their compiles fail? You know, that whole mess of stuff that, uh, um, that students do that you wouldn't be able to capture in uh, a learning management system. So in this case, uh, a person I found to be quite an innovative use of uh, VM to gain a better, deeper understanding into the mindsets of, uh, of the students. If anyone's interested, I should just quickly mention all of these slides, the citations are in the notes page, and, and I guess they'll be put up on the, on the website. So if you want to look at any of the sources or the articles, they're certainly available there. Another approach to uh, analytics is from a social learning analytics perspective. Uh, this is a paper that uh, uh, Simon Buckingham Shum and Rebecca Ferguson out of uh, the Knowledge Media Institute in UK did. And uh, they're looking at what are the criteria that we can look at that allow us to gain insight into social learning. So we don't just want to know how often did you log in, um, how are your login or how is your login behavior correlated with your grade. They're really trying to get at a more nuanced or a more complex kind of assessment of the student. And so through their evaluation from social learning analytics end, they're uh, looking at language discourse behavior. They're looking at the outcome of that behavior in terms of long-term impact. They're also looking at how can you automate discourse analysis that goes beyond uh, human discourse analysis. And they found with a fairly high degree of accuracy that uh, through a series of, uh, of course, this, is, this works better with a specialized lang or subject area. You know, if you have a specific subject area where you have some kind of an ontology map, uh, you're able to do a better job analyzing the discourse automatically so that you can actually, and they found a uh, high degree of accuracy approaching 80% in terms of how they were automatically able to grade a text or uh, a tag text versus the approach that they would do if it was through human uh, rankings or human rating. So you can get at some of these complex social systems. Another aspect that's helpful too is that of uh, the quantified self. This really is one of my favorite websites, at least this week, and it's uh, an interesting site if you have a chance to just look at, a big part of data is how it frees students or how it gives students insight into themselves. 
So it's not just that learning analytics are for the university or that learning analytics are for the teacher. Uh, learning analytics can also be very helpful for the individual. And if you're looking for those of you that are looking at applying for some kind of a grant, I know Tim mentioned a few that uh, are available here, um, you might want to just randomly poke around the quantified self site and look at what kind of options can we create that give students data that can drive self-motivation. And this is everything from tracking your sleeping habits to your food to your goals to to uh, you know, you name it. Uh, so it's it's just about literally uh, learning yourself. You're tracking yourself through a variety of tools. It can be on your iPhone or your mobile device, uh, or it can be something that you enter uh, manually. And the goal and the outcome, at least, being that as individuals have better understanding of themselves, that will also contribute to them being in charge of their performance and activity. So it's really about you know the, this notion of autonomous learners, self-regulated learners. So there's some expectations here, but there's a lot of good research insight tools, at least on this, this page, that I would say you could uh, make some progress on. Now, um, this is just a, a simple example. Again, I'm still trying to tease out this notion of uh, analytics from a multi-dimensional perspective so that our analytics aren't relying on single variable or basic variables. And so in this instance, you don't need to you know, look at this for any particular reason other than what you can start to see when you try to get more nuanced in your analytics uh, assessment, things start to get very messy and they start to get much more complex. So in this instance, and this was uh, in an article uh, for a special issue I just edited for Education, Technology, and Society, and uh, this individual is looking at uh, an analytics tool for visualizing discourse. And uh, basically, on the one hand, uh, tagged a variety of, you know, whether it's cognitive, metacognitive, or social exchange, what's the nature of that interaction, and then looking at the result of that interaction, how frequently they interacted, and uh, getting a better sense of just what was happening f through the duration of that conversation. Now the problem with this, and this is a real reality for those of you that are building analytics tools, is that if a tool doesn't intuitively make sense to an educator in a classroom in a short period of time, you might as well not have built it. So you know, when I see an analysis like this, I mean, you know, having read the paper, and I think, well, that's an you know, interesting concept, some interesting ideas to flesh that out. But if this is how you're presenting your data to your end users, you won't necessarily make a big impact. It might be fun for your research, but that's probably where it'll stop. Another illustration here, and this is uh, uh, an article uh, uh, that Nasher Contractor uh, and all did, was uh, this is based on uh, how many of you are I'm, uh, education? I'm guessing many of you are familiar with the work of Bruno Latour. Uh, with act, uh, act, actor network theory. And so what uh, Contractor tried to do with this particular illustration is uh, he tried to say, OK, interaction and discourse, social networks, typically you see a diagram that says George is connected to Jane, who's connected to Bob, who's connected to so-and-so. And then that's sort of the, the diagram that you have. It's, it doesn't account for the increasingly technical dimensions of the systems that we interact with today. So what Contractor did with his crew here was to look at a variety of options. I just want to, just as a potential illustration, like if we can get our network analysis to begin to reflect a broader scope of activity, the models that we develop will become significantly more useful. So in this instance, just look at the left-hand side, you have a series of nodes. These nodes can be people or technology, avatar, chemicals. So uh, there's this notion here that you're creating a socio-technical network of activity, right? So that you're not just looking at you know, what was the connection, but you're actually trying to get at the nature of that interaction, the nature of that connection. Now the relations are also labeled, so you're looking at did they contribute information or did they get information? Uh, did they have a friendship with that one or whatever else happened as a result of that interaction? So no longer, you, your nodes are different, your interactions are different, and then also the attributes are considered too in terms of is it an, you know, an old technology, is it a new technology, uh, are you aggregating it up to department level, who are the people that are involved or participating in these interactions? So just as a quick illustration again, when we're talking about multidimensionality of the, the learning process and the learning experience, getting at the complex social relations that include greater quantities of data and technical systems, uh, whether you get at that through something from a VM perspective or whether you get at it through uh, uh, increasingly diversifying your models so that you begin to integrate multiple data sets, that's, I think, where you start to get a far deeper level of understanding. And so this is just a very, uh, well, simple model. I'll just throw it up here and talk you through it briefly. And uh, we can spend some time uh, on questions. But so at a basic level, 
uh, the data sources that we're using are really scattered across the university. You know, as mentioned, and as this other's article as well, it's uh, the log data that we have access to, it's really analytically cloaked. It's not something that is just, oh, here's the data, now I'll make sense of it by running this algorithm. There's a lot of work that has to be done if you want to get more nuanced analysis. So it's really any interaction between the institution and the learner, uh, and those data sources in a variety of uh, repositories are captured. These repositories often do not connect with each other, as I'm sure you're aware. And then the questions, though, that we're looking at, this is where the uh, challenges are, are most evident from a university end. You know, whether it's we're looking at core sequencing, whether we're looking at getting a better understanding of the, the uh, important variables through teaching and learning activity, also, it's a matter of you know, how real time do we want our data to be? Because in some cases, you know, universities have always done some level of learning analytics. You might at the end of a course get your, your student evaluations back, or you might get a grade breakout that comes through the institutional report uh, you know, by department or by faculty or whatever else. So those things are, are ongoing, but it's really about can you make that available so that teachers can improve what they're doing in a classroom? Or can you make that available so that students are gaining insight beyond just connectedness insight, but they're getting better understanding of how is it the things that I'm involved with, the activities that I'm doing, how are those actually producing the kinds of grades that I'm getting. And quite honestly, for some students, that's a surprise you know, to realize that, oh, because I did this, that happened. Um, so anyways, those are some of the, the issues that, that reside around that. From an academic analytics end, uh, obviously the biggest end that I see there is just the support that needs to come from a senior admin level in making the, uh, the somebody has to sort of pave the path for data sharing. Uh, somebody has to address the issues around setting the ethical guidelines across integrating data sets. Not sure how many of you are familiar with the Total Information Awareness Act uh, that came by shortly. Brilliant idea. I'm sure it's happening now. Uh, but uh, you know, the public outcry was, was quite substantial for privacy and ethics issues. But it, it's exactly that kind of a concern. When you start integrating multiple data sets and you start getting new levels of insight in your students, uh, it can become quite unnerving. One illustration uh, in Wall Street Journal, they looked at how does an insurance company make decisions around who it offers an insurance policy to. So what they did is they worked with, uh, with Deloitte. And so they didn't just look at, I mean, there's data available about all of us. You know, you pay a few thousand dollars, you can get a whack of databases on credit history or location or employment history and, and you know, whatever else. So that data can be purchased and, you know, companies often do. So what they decided to do in this case, because it costs about $1,000 to initiate an insurance policy, they used a variety of purchase data, and then they used a variety of social media data. So they would find out, for example, two people, you know, let's say Sarah and Beth. So uh, Sarah, by tracking her social media, we know she went to the gym today because she checked in on Foursquare. Uh, we know that uh, she ate a healthy lunch because she tweeted a picture of her salad at noon. Um, you know, we see that she went running because she, you know, I don't know, posted a picture of her new running shoes on Facebook. And that data then is meshed with existing purchase data, such as where does she work, what's her credit rating, how far does she commute, and that gives the, uh, the insurance company a health risk profile of this individual. Then you have a second individual who, on the other hand, uh, tweets oh, I just had McDonald's, and you know from your purchase data that she works, uh, you know, she's got a long commute, and the list goes on, and she, her TV watching habits, which are, you know, whatever are available in tweet. So you start to build these data profiles, and this insurance company in particular found that they could, for, for dollars on the person, instead of thousands of dollars, conduct a much more accurate analysis of the insurability. Now, this is the issue with this kind of data, and these analytics models, is that you don't even know that it happened to you. You just never receive the invitation, or you never receive whatever else. So when you start talking about analytics from a classroom or, or a student end, the discussion around privacy and ethics are critical because, the, in my perspective at least, the students need to be aware of the underpinning functioning of the analytics system so that they know what exactly it is that's going on from the perspective of, uh, uh, of the system and the kind of choices that are being made about them. I'm just going to flip. Oh, I did not want to be there. Just going to flip here, just give you a quick conceptual illustration of what I'm looking at. So this is a model. There's a white paper, if any of you are interested, it's on the solarresearch.org site. And uh, it's just a paper where we're looking at, you know, can we as, as researchers pull together a list of, or 
develop a learning analytics platform that allows researchers to develop different modules that sort of plug and play with the system as a whole, rather than having you know somebody develop, oh, I've got this neat little module for analyzing learning management system data, or I've got this neat little approach for analyzing social networks that develop through Twitter for university students. So trying to say, well, can we tr develop a learning analytics platform that others can sort of plug into and begin to use, and researchers can develop as long as they're functioning, you know, developing their, their uh, platforms uh, or their tools, their modules in accordance with the, you know, the API and the platform structure, they, it can be used effectively. So in this case here, so I'll just talk you through this briefly, and this, then I'll pause for, for questions. But so at the center, there's this concept of your analytics engine. And this is where we're doing all of these analytics activities. So you know whether it's the concept development, how do students progress in developing more complex mental models relating to subject matter, discourse analysis, how they make sense of a topic, even something like wayfinding. You know, how do individuals orient themselves to an information space so that they understand what, where do I go to understand what's happening in this space? Uh, you know, semantic analysis or concept patterns that develop. So that's your, your central analytics engine, which, from my perspective at least, educators, uh, researchers don't mind multiple tools, right? I mean, it's, in some cases, it's just the geek syndrome. The more tools, the better. And, uh, but for, for an end user, if you want educators to begin using analytics tools, you really need to create a system that is sort of one-stop shop. I mean, that's the big lesson. I mean, Facebook, before they came along, you could do everything Facebook did, and a lot of us did, through just a variety of social media and different spaces. Uh, what Facebook did, though, was made it broadly available to everyone without having 12 different logins to, uh, to do that kind of activity. So the same holds true from an analytics perspective. Now, the, uh, the other uh, aspect of it is adaptation and personalization. And this focuses on the content perspective, this notion of, of intelligent curriculum. You know, knowledge has a structure. And if you define the structure of knowledge in a discipline, you can begin to contrast learner progress toward that uh, in, in your analysis. This is exactly what companies like Pearson are doing. The partnership that they have with a company called Newton uh, is, is targeting that. You have other analytics companies. This one's focused K to 12, but Dreambox is sort of a, you know, a big one that's uh, frequently mentioned as well. So uh, these are just ways that you take, instead of students taking a full course, you're able to introduce them to the knowledge elements that they need based on the profile that you know about them. So you, you can potentially eliminate some of the redundancy. And then the other aspect, of course, is, is your intervention approaches. How do you begin to respond to student needs? And how do you begin to either through automated ways or through uh, human systems begin to interact and address the needs of students? And of course, you know, everything from the recommender system to social content to system or otherwise. So that's a quick overview of this uh, notion of multidimensional analytics, uh, moving analytics from a sort of a single dimensional data point or basic data point perspective to something that's a little more robust, a little more complex, but hopefully provides a better understanding of the profile of students. So I guess we have time for questions. Yeah. Or not. So I'm just curious about what what do you see the effect of when you get the very complex picture, right. that very nuanced picture that you're talking about? Where do you see the application of that? Is it on a theoretical level? Is it is it on an institutional level? Is it multi-level? Because the complexity of this is interesting, but it's daunting as yeah. well to think about. You're generating a fair amount of data, and then what happens with it? And it might yeah. be early to think about that, but I don't know if you've seen examples of where these sort of multiple nodes come together in a place that then has a, a payoff. Well, there's, uh, I mean, there's a very, very relevant question. Is that so what question, right? You know, great, you spent all your time uh, building whatever system. Now, what am I actually supposed to do with that? Uh, this, and I guess this is where you start to get uh, needlessly opinionated. So uh, I'll, I'll do that. So um, I mean, I think the course model of instruction is not a very effective one. And, uh, and the reason especially is as, as the education uh, system serves a growingly diverse student base, uh, you know, more individuals are coming back to the education system after time and employment. Uh, the university systems more and more offering online or at least blended options, or even where the university isn't offering blended options, students are turning it into a blended course because they're sharing notes and swap. I had one example, uh, my 16-year-old son, I, he was at home the other day, and you know, when, when I was in school, I didn't understand math. You kind of did the best you could, and you go 
to school the next day and hopefully find a few buddies before the class and get the answer, right? But all of a sudden he's sitting there and he got a text in and the person who texted him, she had taken a picture of her well done math homework and just sort of texted him a copy of it. And I thought, well, that's, you know, A, pretty good. But, uh, you know, there's this sense of, well, you're not learning, you're not understanding. So it was just a simple illustration of the course wasn't blended, but they made it a blended course because that's, they have the technology to do that. So I think that the, as more courses become online or have that online component, these data sets that we collect will give us insight into the structure of learning. And we're going to find, obviously, and, and any educator knows this already, but you know, if you have 20 students in a course, all 20 of them have a different knowledge profile. Some of them may have excelled at physics. Some of them may have been horrible at physics. Some of them could probably challenge the, the course and, and maybe do OK because they were just naturally good at it. So it means that you know, instead of one course for 20 people, we want to get to the notion of 20 courses for 20 people. You know, everybody has sort of got their own content model. So I think that's where something like this starts to become interesting, where you're, uh, you're, you have the, the curricular structure, content knowledge structure, if you will, of a course, and you're able to serve the pieces to learners that they need based on the knowledge profile that they have in their interaction with the university system. Now, that's not just conceptual, though. Uh, if you look at a uh, you know, great company, like I said Newton with a K, um, they've got a variety of options, uh, you know, short little videos online that talk about their model. But they say in an afternoon of learning, they're collecting hundreds of thousands of data points on a student. So if you log into Newton in the morning, um, they start off as test prep, but they're, they're really becoming more of a curricular infrastructure for Pierce and other companies. So you can actually use their system to build your curriculum, which then runs on their own system. So it'll match the, the learner to the particular content elements. So if you log in at Newton in the morning at 8 AM, and uh, it knows, you know, George is usually a little dull in the morning, right? Because, you know, but we know by 9 o'clock he has his coffee, so he's a little more alert. So they'll progressively begin to provide me with more complex uh, content pieces as I, as I progress throughout the morning. Now, one morning I log on, and all of a sudden my pattern is not like it typically is. It'll pick up on that virtually after a few quick uh, clicks and exercises, and it'll start to ramp up the complexity of what it provides because I'm more alert. Now, that's just a very small example, but I guess the point I'm trying to say, these kinds of systems are uh, in play in various levels of implementation. Um, in these early days, or I guess we're past that, but the, the, the early, late days, um, are you finding pressure towards certain kinds of uh, teaching and learning approaches that lend themselves more to analytics? I mean, if, if a person is teaching at a fully online university, are they less likely to do open-ended inquiry than something more didactic? Yeah, that, that's a very relevant question. I think, and I think to a degree, I mean, the systems that we use really do drive our pedagogy on a lot of ways. You know, so if you're using a learning management system, if you're teaching exclusively online, the systems that you have access to do influence your technology. So let's say you just have an LMS and you're, you don't have a synchronous component to your, your courses. The bulk of what you're doing is readings, videos, and discussion forums. I mean, yeah, you have a very different type of a feeling in, in that regard than if you're doing other types of, uh, of um, technologies in your courses. So. At this point, though, I haven't seen really instances where that's been the case, where, where the analytics structure has said, you know, teach this way because that gives us better data sets on our students. I think part of the issue also is that, you know, the data models that we create, and this is why, you know, with this model in particular, we're emphasizing openness, you know, open algorithms, because people need to be able to see what's being weighted and how is it being weighted. So if you use, let's say, Blackboard Analytics, you might not have access to those, uh, that, you know, base. It's kind of like saying, here's a chart, but we're not going to give you the raw data that, that created that chart, so you can't even interrogate what happened underneath. Um, so that's why I think, the, from an analytics perspective, I suspect as Blackboard and Desire to Learn and other systems roll out their analytics model, people will start playing to those models because you know it's going to play into from a faculty member it will influence either your student ratings or whatever else that comes out of it. But beyond speculating, I haven't seen specific instances where I could say, yeah, you know, this university now makes everybody teach this way because that's what the analytic tool requires. At the back, Mary? Yeah, George, are you aware of good examples of models that integrate curricular with co curricular or maybe even extracurricular activities? Uh, no, would be probably the best way to answer that one. <laughs> yeah. 
It's a very relevant question, though. But the big question around that is privacy again. You know, from a student end, you know, you really get the sense that, you know, you're creeping on me. You know, like, you know, you're watching me in my social media. One of the things that we have, uh, as I mentioned, uh, because we are an online system, so we have the interactions that happen in, in Moodle, our learning management system. Uh, we also have a synchronous platform, we use Adobe Connect for that. And then we have the social network space where learners can sort of interact and engage. And so we've been very cautious in our analysis of the social space because if students start to feel, I mean, we, we, we've built in recommender system, you know, these are the kinds of people you might want to connect with or, oh, you might want to join this group based on your profile. So we've built those recommender systems in, but very subtly because we're concerned that if you go out and all of a sudden say, uh, oh, George, you didn't log into Moodle yesterday. Are you okay? You know, it's, suddenly it's like, oh, you know, it's sort of this uh, panopticon effect, right? So we're, we're, uh, that's where I think the challenge is. You have in, in social spaces, trust is much more important than in, let's say, a structured LMS space where you're expecting some level of monitoring. The university sets the tone. But if you want students to begin to participate in these social settings, then uh, there is a trust relationship that if you violate it, you lose the learner. They're going to go elsewhere, right? Yes, so there, there. So this type of analytics seems really applicable to MOOCs because of an even wider range of student background and experience and knowledge modeling and so right. forth. Has there been much of that happening yet with MOOCs? And, well, I, I would say, I mean, if I look, let's say you know, you have Coursera, edX, and Udacity right now. Um, and f so from all of those are being driven by uh, computer scientists, more or less. So uh, if it's happening, I'm not necessarily familiar with it, but I would assume, I mean, it has to be happening. I mean, they're all data folks. That's, that's how they're doing a lot of their work. Um, where there's some activity. We have, uh, uh, I'll just back a few slides that I skipped over. Um, we have a, a MOOC on the future of education that starts October 8th. And so we're looking at just a variety of components, you know, pedagogy, uh, how that changes, uh, data and analytics in education. We're looking at entrepreneurship and commercialization, a few other topics. We do have a research model built into this. This one is it's a Gates-funded uh, project. Uh, we're working with Desire to Learn for the LMS for the system. So we have some specific analytics questions that we're asking. But I mean, in this instance, you know, we'll probably hit about 10,000 students for this course. Coursera, you know, 40,000, 50,000, 100,000 students, it's a completely different scale. Uh, so all I can say is we are doing analytics on it, but uh, I'm pretty sure Coursera and others are, are involved as well. Is there a question? The opinion is you're absolutely right. It is a risk. Uh, recommender systems, you know, they, they can be fairly effective. But you know, I had a delightful experience. Uh, two examples. Uh, one is never let your teenage daughter buy books on your Amazon account. <laughs> right? Absolutely screw up your recommendations. I'm still trying to recover. And uh, but so that's an example, right? Because so there are things recommender systems aren't. In, you know, they're not intelligent necessarily the way we would need them to be. Another one, all of a sudden, I'm, I log into YouTube and I had watched a video on, uh, you know, it was on a Cognos IBM product, and uh, all of a sudden it said, because you watch this video by Cognos, you would like to watch Britney Spears hold it against me, or I don't know what it was. But I'm just like, I don't see that correlation there. <laughs> but so recommender systems, they 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 have their weaknesses, but. There's a lot of attention that's been paid to exactly that concept. And you know, Jacques Ellul wrote the best book I've read on, on some of the issues around technology. It's called The Technological Society. He wrote it back in the 60s and really looked at how, you know, as we technify greater segments of society, we lose the serendipity. We lose some of the human dimensions to, to just interactions, period. So in that case, I would say there is a real risk. Uh, Valdis Krebs, uh, he's done some work on network analysis. So he took a look at the books purchased on Amazon by Republican Democrat 
oriented. Where's the overlap? And well, there isn't much. There are a few that would fit, you know, sort of Bert's notion of you know structural holes. There's a few that fill those gaps, but by and large, you read what you read, and on Twitter as well, you know. I'm not sure how many of you are on Twitter, but you know, if you're not reading someone regularly that really irritates you, you probably don't have a diverse enough network because you're not encountering ideas that contrast with your own. So short answer is that those are issues from an um, analytics perspective that need to be considered. You know, what's the role of serendipity? What's the role of modifying recommendations? I mean, you should be able to delete or say this is an inaccurate recommendation for me, and you should have that level of control as well. But the bigger issue is really educational. Right, you know, teaching individuals how to move outside of filter bubbles, uh, to use, I guess, that term. So there's, there's a question there. Well, I think this is related uh, to a couple of points you already raised. Uh, there are a lot of recommender sites out there that will recommend courses based on maximizing GPA. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's natural. So my question is, when are we, are, can you cite examples of going beyond GPA as a measure of performance? You know, kind of no, I mean, uh, UBC just as one example, and, and uh, Austin P is the example I provided earlier. Uh, those are typically looking at, at success in a course, and they look at success in the course really from an academic performance perspective, which GPA would be the proxy for that. So, so you're right, I mean, that's the way these systems are done. Now, most of them, Austin P, for example, they allow you to also rate. So there's a rating option, and uh, you're given a, also a likelihood of doing well in this course. So it's not just that it gives you take this next, it gives you a sort of some scheme of recognition of the percentage of importance that this has for you. Um, University of British Columbia is one illustration as well where they're looking at creating uh, a map, you're sort of an academic map or a route through a particular curriculum and your prospect of being successful. But once again, that's tied heavily to the academic performance of others who've taken the course before. So, I mean, beyond that, I'm not aware. Uh, the question would be what proxy would you use instead of GPA? You know, student self-reported self satisfaction with a course. Uh, you know, you, that's the issue always is defining, you know, if you want to change the criteria, then what's the new proxy you're going to use that's going to be instantiated in, in a data model that'll give you the insight that you want. But you kind of pointed out, if you have uh, some way of calculating the odds of being successful, and, you know, somehow tying that into some reporting mechanism, say, the student beat the odds, you know, the student worked hard yeah. to, to beat the odds. Well, it gets back to the question that the, the lady over here asked is, where's the challenge, right? You know, if, uh, you know, sometimes, and, and admittedly, I guess with any recommender system, you know, at, to a certain degree, you can provide a serendipitous element as well. I mean, really, you know, it's how you've structured your, your recommender system that really makes a difference. So when we did some of the recommender work on the landing, which is our social network system, you know, there is sort of, you, you want to sort of, as much as you can, bring in that X factor of, yeah, this is probably a good match, but sometimes a not a good match is a good match. You know what I mean? Like in terms of, so how do you, you can try to reduce that algorithmically, but you're not always going to be successful. That's why I apparently should watch Britney Spears. <laughs> So other questions, I saw some hands up over here, Connie. You suggested that in order for a university to be successful with learning analytics, the administration should try to have data sets that can interact with each other successfully and uh, you and have some instruction about ethics. Are there other things you're seeing as you're going around the world to different universities that you feel would be good advice for us as we try to promote and facilitate learning analytics here. Yeah, I mean, advice is always contextual, which by nature means someone on the outside shouldn't be giving advice. But uh, so, I mean, there's a few things that sort of come front of mind around uh, you know analytics deployment. I mean. The approach that we've taken was, first of all, through a broad, uh, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, analysis of our own data. We wanted to look at what are we, what are we, you know, auditing, what do we collect, and what what do we have that we can do with that. But the biggest problem I think is is it boils down to, you know, who do you want to use the analytics, and uh, what do you what is that your goal with those analytics uh, models that you're developing? So if you want 
let's say, all faculty in a university to be able to use analytics. You have to spend an exorbitant amount of time, first of all, developing an effective representation of the data. So this is everything from your dashboards to, to uh, making it as intuitive as possible. You know, some of the short little diagrams I showed earlier weren't intuitive. They're very complex. They mean a lot to the researcher. They're very informative if the researcher's talking about it. But if someone's supposed to come at it cold, they're, they're very difficult to read and make sense of. Uh, the other aspect is, uh, you know, University of Technology out of Sydney, for example, in Australia, uh, they kicked off an initiative called the Data Intensive University. And uh, their whole goal was to frame the language of functioning of the university in the language of data. Now, that probably you know, should scare a lot of social scientists or humanities folks. But still, the point is they, they said, as a university, we want to build a system where all faculty are capable of interacting meaningfully with data and all students are capable of interacting meaningfully with data. Now that's a big capacity development initiative, right? Because in some cases, uh, you know, for many people, the only statistics course they took was, was uh, you know, 20 years ago, and they've probably very happily forgotten most of what was there. So those are some of the issues on the, the social capital development. Uh, the other aspect is, is change management, uh, which uh, obviously, I'm, you know, I'm sure as a leader you're aware, but if people feel that something is being foisted on them, and if they're ideologically opposed to what they feel is sort of being snuck in the back door, uh, you know, there's a reason why there's a bit of a, well, significant pushback to standardized testing movement, as a, because people are saying, no, that's not sufficient, it doesn't capture it. So I think there are some challenges that, that universities face in convincing faculty that what they're trying to do with analytics is legitimately for the learner. There was, uh, you know, Texas A&M had one experience with analytics where they tried to quantify faculty. And some of you may have heard of this, and end result was, you know, theoretically a Nobel laureate who, you know, wouldn't was actually a net money loss by this model, and a, a marginally functional computer scientist uh, was generating loads of money for the university because he or she could teach a whack of students, and this Nobel laureate was interacting with, you know, so, so that's where the issues come in. So faculty, I think, to some level, distrust or could distrust analytics if they're not communicated well. So there's just a few quick, random, decontextualized advice points. Any other questions? Maybe it's time for that, but what trend have you seen in terms of people using analytics for institutions or instructors to actually understand students differently? So if you're yeah. not using the typical means of understanding what the person is and learning or in your student population, are there groups that are looking hard at, at doing that, using Okay, so I'll start with that last question first while I try and remember what the first question was. So that one's recent. Um, you know, that, I think that that's a, a big challenge, especially in digital spaces. And one of the things is the university is, to some degree, losing its mediative role in the lives of learners, right? So, uh, you know, back in, you know, master's days, I'm sure you recall sitting in a most of you probably, but sitting in a you know university library somewhere, moving from one citation in a paper form, digging through a whack of you know of, uh, magazines or articles, journals to get to another one, and now all of a sudden you know what used to take me a week, uh, a student can do in an hour of Google Scholar, right? So that's one element I think that uh, really has changed the. Um, uh, the technology has changed that relationship. So there's a, which means that students can now do things for themselves that you might have expected the university to do. So if a student wants to keep in contact with other students as a course concludes, they still have that option. You know, they, they can either stay connected through, through uh, various social media. What we've done as an illustration, and this was part of our intent, is uh, you're likely familiar you know, with the work of Vincent Tinto where he looks at you know, the two critical criteria for individuals to succeed in, in an academic context is social integration and academic integration, which means that they feel, you know, they feel they have the knowledge, support, and the capacity to do what they need to do. And secondly, they feel that they're connected as part of a community. 
And this is something that Saracen wrote about way back when, looking at uh, the development of communities in, in these, you know, sense of community, I guess, would be, would be uh, psychological sense of community would be his language. So those are definitely uh, experiences that you can, from a technological end, provide some guidance on. Uh, when I was at University of Manitoba, we had we created a virtual learning commons, which gave students the opportunity to connect to one another. So physically, they're all on campus, but they were interacting through these social systems that we hoped would allow them to exist, uh, relationships to exist post class conclusion. The same thing I've mentioned the landing several times now, but that's what we're hoping as well. It's it's a tool that we're using to create social connections with learners that give them that, that psychological sense of community or that give them that sense of social connectivity to a university they might not have because they're doing the bulk of their learning online. So that was question two. Question one didn't come to me yet. So it's, it's sort of tied to it. I mean, it relates to a number of discussions. So in what way are we using these tools to visualize students differently? Ah, OK. Okay, so I can bail on that question. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, because I didn't have a good one to to come back to you. With. No problem. All right. Any further questions? If not, let's thank George. All right. Thank you.